Thanks for checking out this No Spoilers movie review. So let's talk about the 1982 film The Slumber Party Massacre. This is currently streaming on Sh uh, the Shutter streaming service for horror films and TV series uh, when I'm recording this, so you can check it out there. Uh, actually, the day I'm recording this, it just went up, although I know I'm not going to put this video out, video out immediately. And then you may be asking yourself, though, well, Shudder put on Slumber Party Massacre 2. Might Carlin review that? Maybe. I might. Anyway, let's go ahead and talk about the Slumber Party Massacre, which, by the way, this is the very first time I've ever seen it. Um, I know when I say these types of things, a lot of people are just like, what, you've never seen that? That's crazy. And I get that about a lot of films. Um, but it, I just have to reiterate the fact that when I was growing up, my parents were very controlling with what movies I really could and could not see. Once I got to college is when I started really getting into watching films in general. Uh, and uh, it took me a while to then decide that horror was my main genre I loved. So ever since then, I've been trying to catch up. And watching the Slumber Party Massacre was part of catching up. So let's talk about this. Uh, the director... Her name is Amy Holden Jones, and she wrote she wrote such films as Mystic Pizza, The Relic, and Beethoven. Yes, Beethoven about that lovable Saint Bernard. This is not too uncommon. There, I mean, people when they are working in films, sometimes they're doing horror films, sometimes they're doing family films. It's kind of all over the place. People kind of take whatever jobs they can get, and you can't really fault them. Um, so yeah, it's it's just one of those things. So uh, I guess one of the best examples I can think of is uh, individuals involved in um, Reanimator, Herschel Gordon Lewis, and uh, there's one other guy, I'm blanking at the moment, uh, were involved in doing Reanimator, but then they also did Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. So you're like, Reanimator? Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Ugh. Oh, man. Oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't, Hor did I say Herschel Gordon Lewis? I meant Stuart Gordon. Gordon in the name just got me. Stuart Gordon. Sorry about that. Uh, so this film, I will say right off the bat, it feels very 80s, which makes sense because it was done in 1982. It feels very slasher formulaic, which makes sense because it was shot in the 80s and it is a slasher. But one of the things that really hit me after I finished the film was it borrowed slash stole a lot from the original Halloween film by John Carpenter. And really, I thought about it more, and I was just like, I feel like literally what happened is that they they were like, let's make it a film. Uh, we want to do a slasher. Let's use Halloween as our template. So they took Halloween, and then they just changed a few things about it, and it's still Halloween, basically. I mean, if you watch this film and you think Halloween, like watch the original Halloween, then watch the Slumber, Slumber Party Massacre back to back, it's the same film. There are a lot of things that are exactly the same and in common. And they actually, it seems they borrowed some shots from Halloween as well. Like a lot of the uh, outside camera work looks very much like Halloween. So it basically, this is Halloween, but with some things changed. For that reason, I actually quite, quite like this film. Um, it's not like a phenomenal film or anything, but considering 80s slasher, it's a good time. One of the things that really stood out to me, though, is that they had no mystery to it, whereas some slashers were, were seeking to be more uh, covert about what's going on, and then eventually you find out what's really happening. This one's just like, here's the killer, and he's going to try and kill people, and it's very, very straightforward, which, you know, honestly, I w at first I was like, oh, man, I don't know about this, but they keep it engaging. I mean, it, they keep the tension up. They keep the pacing really good. The story's just fun. It's not like a great film, but it's a fun film. I had a lot of good time, a lot of good time, a very good time watching this film. Sorry, I'm tired today. Um, so it starts with the tip with a typical horror trope. Uh, it's like I said, it's, it's it's Halloween. Basically, you'll pick up on what that is. There's no spoilers. So uh, the first the first death I will say I did not see coming, and I don't think you will if you're new to this film. Uh, at, but at the same time, when the first death happens, you're like, is nobody seeing this right now? Because it's like right there. Like there are other people there. You'll see what I mean. It, it's very much out in the open and there's other, other people there. And you're like, people would see slash hear this going on. So it's not very realistic for that matter. But hey, 
it's a horror film and us horror fans are very forgiving <laughs> with horror films and whether they're realistic or not. Uh, the acting overall in this, by the way, is serviceable. It's not great. It's not terrible. It's very in the middle. It, it fits for 80s horror. It really does fit. So it's fine. Uh, they waste no time getting to the nudity and the sex appeal in this. Uh, there's even a shower scene within the first 10 minutes. I think it's about like the eight minute mark or so. There are a bunch of women in high school taking showers together. Uh, this film, like a lot of slashers, plays heavily on nudity and sex appeal, uh, which, you know, it doesn't hold up nowadays as far as standards for horror films go, but uh, that was that time. Like, they, there was a time, believe it or not, where they believed that they had to have nudity and sex appeal in films, particularly horror, to get people in the theater seats. Um, there are still films that go by that formula, but there are a lot that don't, that see it as antiquated. And I mean, it is because we figured out we don't need it, but these films, these films still exist and there's still a lot of people who really dig it. I don't really care that much about the nudity and the sex appeal and stuff like that. Um, either way, to be honest, uh, I think when it's in newer films, it bothers me because you don't have to do that now. In older films, it doesn't bother me because it was a different time then. And I understand that. So I'm just like, yeah, whatever. Um, so this movie, the girls love to get naked around each other. It's this whole thing where it's just like, guess what, people? When women are alone, they love to get naked in front of each other. Which is very much not realistic, but it fits into the whole 80s horror trope. Uh which I think was playing, obviously, a lot towards a male audience where they were kind of saying, hey, guess what, guys? Ladies, they love the nudity. They love to be naked and around each other, too. So it kind of creates this voyeuristic, uh, like, look into a secret life for, for male horror fans back then. So it's an appeal. Um, we've come a long way. Yeah, I was just talking about how we've basically come a long way. We don't need nudity. Uh, the cast is set up as a bunch of bimbos pretty much immediately, but they do get smarter as the film goes on, which I do like. Is there's a little bit of development, not a lot with the characters, but a little bit of development in intelligence, and they're not as, you know, straightforward stupid. Uh, the other thing to say about this, the victims in this, much like a lot of slashers, they're bad teenagers who need to pay. You know, much like we, we all referenced in Friday the 13th, the, the camp counselors are out having sex, doing drugs, drinking, so they gotta pay. The slasher's gonna kill them. And that's what's at play in the Slumber Party Massacre. It does not deviate from that. These kids are bad. They gotta pay. It's that whole thing. Um, excuse me. Uh, yeah, like I was saying, it's very straightforward. You know who the killer is. You see his face very, very early on. Probably within the first 15 minutes or so. Yeah, it's like immediately. So I was, I was pretty surprised by that. I was like, oh, okay. But it ended up working as a film. That's all good. So the main instrument of death in this film is a very different one. And I like that, especially when you're doing a slasher film uh, with the formula. There's usually one weapon that the killer ends up using. So when you make it something interesting that other people aren't really doing in their films, I find that fun. Um and I feel like in this instance, they pick something that's particularly brutal. The other thing is, I mean, you you know, people know what it is. It's, it's a drill. Um, if you've seen, you know, the cover art for it, you know what it is. It's, it's a drill. And so it kind of has this whole tie in to like penetration. And it's the same thing with Friday the 13th with like knives and stuff like that. Um, f through horror, it, it's a male killer penetrating female victims for the most part. Uh, and that's a whole theme. That's a whole thing. And uh, do, 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 do. so it follows the typical formula, yep, with the transgressions of the main characters. Uh, you can tell the filmmakers borrowed heavily from Halloween. Yeah, I already went over that. It's so true. I, and seriously, like I said, like watch this movie and think Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. It's like almost the same. The only thing is babysitting versus slumber party, pretty much. And a few other little changes, but... Uh, I will say that it's very effective, though, when you have a babysitting situation or a slumber party situation. It's very effective for a slasher film, which is probably why it's been that those things have been mined very much uh, over the years. 
Uh, and I think part of that is that it, it's a confinement thing. And this is something that I actually really, really like in horror films. I talked about it in my review of Prince of Darkness by John Carpenter. Uh, I really like it when the setting of a horror film is very small, it's very confined, and you feel like the characters are trapped. And they're trapped there with the evil, whether that means the evil is on the outside, like it is in this instance, outside of a house because the person's babysitting or they're having a slumber party, so they can't go outside of it, but there's a possibility that he could get in. But then there's also uh, the ones where they do it where they're trapped inside and the evil's been inside the whole time, like in Prince of Darkness. I really like those. I feel like it's very effective for keeping tension up, for making it more scary and creepy. I just like it. It's just it's just a thing for me. Put a comment down there and let me know your thoughts on those types of horror uh, when they use that as a mechanism for keeping the tension up, keeping the horror going. But I really like that. It's set up very well so you don't know what the killer's doing, in my opinion, versus if people are messing with them. So they kind of throw out enough red herrings where it's kind of like, how much of this, at least early on, is the killer? How much of this is people messing with the main characters? And they do keep it very ambiguous for, for a bit. Uh, but then they also will have like the reveals of, oh, this was the killer. Oh, this was some dude just messing with them because teenagers, you know? <laughs> uh, this movie plays to what... Uh, oh, yeah, I was just talking about the confined areas. Sorry for repeating myself. I'm reading through my notes, so it's kind of... I don't know what I'm going to read next because I forget... Uh, watching movies like this remind me of how different times are currently. Now, it's not just the film evolution aspect, which, you know, I'm always thinking about that when I'm watching older films, like how film has changed so much, whether it's the directing style or the content or the acting, you know, whatever. But also, um, information availability was a big thing that, that popped into my mind because there's a, I wouldn't say like a long portion, but a decent sized portion of some of these characters trying to figure out what happened in the ball game yesterday or last night? Like, what? Who, how did people score the runs in, in this ball game? And so they're calling people trying to get this information. And that just made me think, man, it's so crazy to think that, like, if you missed a sporting event back then when it was aired, that was it. You, you literally had to find a person in person or through your telephone to ask, hey, what happened if they saw it? Nowadays, you'd just be like, oh, I'll just, you know, look it up on my phone or on my computer. Uh, I can easily get that information. It's available everywhere. Plus, there will be clips on YouTube. Um, you know, I can go on demand through my cable provider and rewatch the game if I want to. So it just kind of popped into my mind that it was just like, it's really nuts to think about that availability difference. How literally, if you didn't see the sporting event, you're going to have a harder time getting that information unless you know someone who was watching that sporting event. It's crazy. Just think about that, people. It's crazy. Technology, it's it's always progressing. Yeah. Uh, so they, I think they did a good job of capturing the uncertainty of what situation ends up being safe in, in here and what situation is not safe for the characters. They kind of, they, they do a really good job of showing how the characters are feeling and what the inner workings of their thought process is with, okay, there's a noise outside. Is that a person who needs help or is that the killer? Or um, do we even know that it's just one killer or is someone else in on it? So there's a lot of second guessing that goes on in these situations that are kind of like these you need to act fast. And it's interesting to see then what the characters end up deciding. And it does a really good job of kind of conveying their fear, their paranoia, their second guessing, and just that struggle that I believe you would have in that situation of, is this safe? Is this not safe? Do I act like a hero in this instance? What if I act like a hero and it ends up being the killer and then I'm dead? It, it's like the um, being a hero versus self-preservation. And I think they did a really good job in the script of having that play out. So... Uh, that was cool. That was really cool. I was pretty impressed by that uh, because, you know, this isn't a very fancy film. It doesn't do a whole lot of original stuff. So, you know, when you get those little nuggets of, of cool, it's nice. So anyway, that's kind of all I have to say about the Slumber Party Massacre. Like I said, streaming currently on Shutter. when I recorded this. Check it out. Uh, it should probably still be up. Um, I'm pretty sure. 
So, uh, yeah, I liked it. I enjoyed it. Like I said, it's not a phenomenal film, but if you like slashers, especially 80s slashers, it's a good time, and I would definitely recommend it for you folks out there. So in my five-star scale with half stars in play, I'm going to give this a good three and a half stars. It doesn't make it to the four because it's not like a really good movie, but I don't think it deserves just a three because it's better than half a star from you know, in the middle. So three and a half stars. Check this out. Like it. I'm glad I saw this film. Thank you, Shudder. Anyway, thanks everyone for checking out this video. Please do me some favors. Spread the word about my channel if you know other people who are really into horror. That would really help me out. But what really, really, really helps me out is people hitting the subscribe button and getting your friends and family and whoever you know to also hit that subscribe button because if I can continue to grow, it drives me even further to do more. And if I can get to a point where I have enough subscribers that I can actually make a little bit of money off of this, I think it'll motivate me more to maybe do more videos. Because at the moment, I'm really just doing like two videos a week, uh, maybe three here and there. But honestly, if I can get to a point where I'm motivated enough because I'm actually making some money off of this, I would try and do potentially even one every day, which would be, well, maybe not that because that'd be a lot because I have a job. So, you know. Anyway, thanks everyone for checking this out. Put some comments down there. Have you seen Slumber Party Massacre? Do you want to see it? Give me your thoughts. Give me a like if you want to. But thank you so much. And until next time, keep it brutal.